hearts and our lives. Many of you had not the opportunity this morning to be in the service because of ministry responsibilities throughout the building, so you did not have the opportunity to hear the message this morning. It was an outstanding message on salvation, and uh, certainly we praise the Lord for our guests. And uh, this is the first opportunity that we've had as a church to have Brother Paul Schwanke here. And I certainly have appreciated his ministry already, and I'm looking forward to the rest of this week. Uh, Brother Swanky was born in Hartford, Connecticut, or at least in those parts. And uh, God has uh, had him in the field of evangelism for over 23 years now. And he makes his home in the greater Ari Phoenix, Arizona area. And we're glad to welcome him here to Cleveland, Ohio. God bless you, Brother Swanky, as you come to preach to us tonight. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 in your Bible tonight. And I just certainly have just been blessed in a wonderful way by the song service tonight. I mean, the choir and the orchestra and the specials and uh, it's that deaf choir tonight, just what a tremendous job. And I'll tell you, you folks have just been blessed of the Lord. You know, a lot of people say, isn't it great to see such talent? And I don't like that word. Uh, I'm just amazed by how much hard work goes into people who sing like that and work like that. And, and what we call talent usually is just hard work. And I'm so thankful for those at Cleveland Baptist Church that have given themselves to sing and to be in a choir and to be in the deaf choir and to do the instruments and uh, the pianos as well and the organ just uh, just glorious song service tonight man that's a foretaste of glory divine that that'll get you ready to preach or shout or holler or do something crazy but my that was just wonderful tonight Elizabeth Clefane was a young lady living in Fifeshire Scotland years ago her father and mother both have been taken early in her life and and for that, she was a shy girl and a lover of poetry, very quiet young lady. And she watched her older teenage brother go off into the world into sin. And one day she was so concerned, she wrote some words in a poem and pleading with her brother to come back to the Lord. Not at long after that, as a young lady, Elizabeth Clefane lost her life as well. It was years later that D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey were running through a, a Scotland catching a train. Mr. Sankey had bought a penny newspaper, and he got on the train and began to read that paper, and he came across the poem that Elizabeth Clefane had written. He said, Mr. Moody, you may use this in a message someday. And Moody said, read it to me. And he began to read it, and he got out of the corner of his eye. He saw D.L. Moody was busy with some mail he'd gotten from America. And so he just cut that poem out. He stuck it in his coat pocket, and he forgot it was there. It was later that afternoon at a preaching service, the preacher Horatio Bonar was preaching on the subject of the Good Shepherd. When it was done, D.L. Moody stood up and said to Ira Sankey, I want you to sing a song about a good shepherd. And Ira Sankey began to panic because not only he didn't know a good song about a good shepherd, he had never even heard a song about a good shepherd. And that's when he brushed up against that piece of paper in his pocket. He said he never did it before and he was never able to do it again. But right there on the spot, he began to sing. God gave him a melody and he sang the words Elizabeth Clefane had written. There were 99 who safely lay in the shelter of the fold. And aren't you glad that when you and I were that one lost sheep, the Savior went out of his way to save you. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What a glorious thing. Luke chapter 17, just before I begin preaching tonight, I'd certainly like to take a moment and uh, express our gratitude and appreciation to Cleveland Baptist Church. A year ago today, a gentleman, actually a little earlier than that, but a year ago today was the opening service of a new church in Phoenix where I live, uh, the Lakeside Baptist Church of Peoria, Arizona. Churches like Cleveland Baptist Church saw fit to send our pastor to Phoenix. And Phoenix is a huge city, well over three million people. If you were to take Phoenix and put it on top of the state of Connecticut where I grew up, the city and its surroundings would cover the entire state. Last year, 250,000 people moved into Phoenix in one year. For the last 20 years, Phoenix and Las Vegas have been the two fastest growing major cities in America. And uh, yet the handful, just I mean, probably count them on two fingers and maybe have uh, two hands and maybe have a finger or two left over of independent Baptist churches that believe our Bible and hold any kind of standards. And yet the Lord has touched the hearts and lives of some men to come and start churches. And one of them, Pastor Dave Crichton, a gentleman that uh, you folks have taken on to support and he asked me especially to express his thanks and his appreciation to you the Lord's blessed us in a wonderful way we had our first year anniversary today and uh, had hundred and thirty people and just a tremendous day and the Lord's just blessing every week it just seems to get better and better uh, we're still Wednesday night in the pastor's home we had about 45 people in his house the other night hanging off the rafters tearing his place apart so there are a few prayer requests if we might we do need a building we do need a place to meet a bigger place and uh, if you could pray for that. Also, Brother Crichton and his wife 
gave birth to a baby, a Down syndrome child, a wonderful little baby in the month of May. And, and uh, that little baby is going to need some open heart surgery in November, the first week. And as well, Brother Crichton had uh, some emergency surgery in the month of July, and he's going back under the knife October the 18th. And if you could remember to pray for our pastor, for our church, and for his little boy, that'd just be a tremendous blessing. How thankful we are that churches like Cleveland Baptist Church are interested enough in a place like Phoenix, Arizona, to help somebody start a church and do a job for the Lord. And, and I'm so thankful to tell you what great things the Lord has done, and we're excited about our local church. All right, the book of Luke tonight, chapter 17, and let me invite you once again, if you're physically able to do so, uh, stand together with me as we read from Luke chapter 17 and verse number 32. Luke chapter 17 tonight and verse number 32. And the Bible says, remember Lot's wife. Lord Jesus, I pray tonight as we open the Bible that you would convict us and you would speak to us. And Lord, I'm asking and praying that the mighty power of God would fall upon this service tonight. And Lord, we're so grateful for what we've been able to hear and what we have seen tonight. What a wonderful picture of the love of God and the Savior saying, come and be saved. And yet now, Lord, as we open the Bible, we need you to do the work. We need the Spirit of God to fall upon this place and to break our hearts tonight. Save the one without the Savior. Help your people. In Jesus, my Savior's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Not long ago, I was reading through Luke chapter 17, and, and I had a reaction reading the Bible that I don't know if I've ever had before. And maybe it was just the wrong day, maybe the wrong team had won the night before. I'm not exactly sure what it was. But reading through Luke chapter 17, maybe for the first time in my life, I honestly became angry reading the Bible. And the first that got me going, I think, was Luke 17 and verse number 20, where the Bible says, and when he, speaking of Jesus, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees. You know, I read that phrase and I stopped for a moment, and the more I thought about it, the more it just began to grate against me. Who do these Pharisees think they are that they could ever demand anything from the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, these low-life Pharisees that accomplish nothing, these of whom the Lord Jesus Christ said they were serpents. I mean, these hypercritical, fault-finding Pharisees, who do they think they are ever coming to the Son of God and making a demand? of him. Shall the thing formed say to him that hath formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? The question in Romans was this, Who art thou that repliest against God? And who do these Pharisees think they are that they could come to the Lord Jesus Christ and think they were so important and think that they were so great and think they were so intelligent that somehow they had the right to make a demand of Jesus Christ? Exactly who do these fraudulent people think they are? And you know, to make matters worse in verse number 20 is that when they come demanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, you notice their demand was this, when the kingdom of God should come. Now, I guess that shouldn't surprise us a whole lot tonight because when you have arrogance, there is something that you usually find like a glove in a hand with arrogance. I mean, going right along with arrogance, usually you will find ignorance. And sure enough, in chapter 17, in verse number 20, you will have the Pharisees coming with a powerful dose of arrogance, and they are going to show ignorance of the Word of God. And they come to the Son of God thinking they have the right to make a demand of Him, and they come demanding when the kingdom of God should come. Now, i got to tell you something, folks. These jokers couldn't even get the question right. You see, what the Lord Jesus had to do in chapter 17 was take them back to Kingdom 101, and they couldn't even get the question right. And they came thinking they were so smart and they were going to trap the Son of God, saying, when is the Kingdom of God going to come? And the answer is this, the Kingdom of God is never going to come, because the Kingdom of God is not a kingdom you touch with your hands. It is not a kingdom that you put your feet in. The Kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. That's why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he can 
cannot see the kingdom of God. And so the Lord Jesus takes them to Kingdom 101 and tells them in verse 20, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You're never going to see it. Because you'll neither say in verse 21, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in you. My friend, the kingdom of God is not a physical, literal kingdom. The kingdom of God is God's spiritual family. You see, these arrogant Pharisees that wanted to push the hot button and wanted to impress the crowd with their great intelligence, they couldn't even get the question right. And it's no small thing in verse 22 that it starts like this, and he said unto his disciples, you see, after the Lord Jesus quickly disposes of these arrogant Pharisees and makes them look mighty silly for their unintelligent question, then he turns to somebody that was teachable. And he turned to his disciples who did not have the spirit and the attitude of those Pharisees, and he began to instruct them about the day when the kingdom of heaven will come. Now, you understand the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, but the kingdom of heaven is a literal, real kingdom. And one day the kingdom of heaven is coming to this earth, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule, and he is going to reign for 1,000 years. The spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God is family. The physical, literal kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. And so the Lord looks at his disciples and begins to explain to them when the kingdom of heaven should come. The day will come in verse 22 when you shall shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. Now Jesus said, Gentlemen, the kingdom is literally going to come, this kingdom of heaven. But he said, Here's the time frame. Number one, there's going to be a place called Calvary. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And Jesus said of this generation, he is going to be rejected. First, there's going to be the cross. But then the Bible tells us that at the end of this time frame called the tribulation, the Son of Man is going to come in power and in great glory. And the Bible says, as the lightning shines from the east even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And Jesus went on in verse number 26. He said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And in 28, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And so now the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, Before the kingdom of heaven comes, number one, there's going to be the cross. Number two, there is going to be a time of great tribulation. Why, the message of Noah is you will not escape the flood unless you're in the ark. The message of Sodom, you will not escape the fire unless you flee the wrath to come. My friend, the message of the tribulation is this, that unless you're taken home before the tribulation starts, unless you're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, you will not escape the judgment of God. And the days of Noah, they couldn't escape the flood. In the days of Sodom, they could not escape the fire. And in the tribulation, not a man, not a woman, not a boy or girl will escape the wrath of God as it falls from heaven. And so the Pharisees come demanding when this kingdom of God should come. And Jesus said, you don't even have the question right. He said, let me explain when the kingdom of heaven comes. First, there's going to be the cross. Then there is going to be the tribulation. And then the kingdom of God is going to come. Or the the kingdom of heaven shall come to this earth. And that brings us to the text we have tonight in Luke chapter 17 in verse number 32, uh, where seemingly out of the field, the Lord Jesus Christ makes a most profound statement. And he said it like this, remember Lot's wife. Can you imagine such a statement coming from the Lord Jesus? In fact, as I searched through the Bible, I couldn't find one other person in the Word of God of whom the Lord Jesus commanded us to remember them. I mean, the Bible never says, remember Moses, remember Daniel. I mean, it does say, remember what Abraham, my servant, hath done. And Nehemiah looked up to heaven one day and said, remember me for good. Yet apart from those statements, there's not a man in the Bible, not another woman in the Bible of whom Jesus 
said, remember them. He never told us to remember Peter or John or the Apostle Paul. He never said to remember John the Baptist or Elijah or Elisha. He never said, remember Micaiah or one of the mighty prophets of the Old Testament. But folks, of all the people that Jesus would go out of his way to tell us to remember tonight, it's an amazing thing to me. He tells us to remember a woman whose name we don't even know. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Remember Lot's wife. And so if it's such an important thing that Jesus told us to remember Lot's wife, then tonight I'm going to invite you to take your Bible, if you would, and turn back to Genesis chapter 19. And I'm going to ask you to use your Bible tonight and maybe your imagination just a bit. And let's see if we can't use our Bible and our minds to, to bring Mrs. Lot into the service with us tonight. And from the pages of the Word of God, I do believe that if Mrs. Lot could join us at Cleveland Baptist Church, and if somehow Mrs. Lot could stand on this platform tonight, and she could look at you and she could look at me, I do believe that she would have a message and a story to tell. And should Mrs. Lot come back from eternity tonight, and if somehow she could stand in front of you and me, I do believe there are are some things that Mrs. Lot would tell us to be sure to remember. And so from your Bible tonight in Genesis chapter 19, I want to give you four things from the life of Mrs. Lot that you and I have got to remember tonight, four things that we cannot afford to forget. I do believe if Mrs. Lot could come back from eternity and stand before us tonight, the first thing that she would tell us is this, remember the consequences of immorality. Remember the consequences of immorality. Do you see the story in Genesis 19 and verse number one. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now my lords, turn, and I pray you into your servant's house, and tarry all night and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. The angels have come from heaven, and there are many tonight who speculate and believe that one of these angels may well have been the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the angels, if it's so, if it's not, truly these two angels have been sent from heaven with the message. And the message was that God was tired of the sins of Sodom, that the patience and the mercy of God had finally run out. And now the wrath of God was ready to fall from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And the angels have come to warn Lot and his family of the impending judgment. Can you see the angels as they approach the city? And Lot invites them to come into his house and I find it impressive. This is the first time that in the Word of God we find the mention of a house. And isn't it a sad thing? The house is the household of Lot. And these two angels, full well knowing what Sodom was like, they would rather spend the night sleeping on the streets of Sodom than they would go in the house of somebody like Lot, a family that had disintegrated and a family that had fallen victim to the allure of the world. And yet as Lot pressed upon them greatly, finally they enter into his house. And in verse number 4, the Bible says, Before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. My friend, just when you think sin has hit its depths, it finds a way to sink just a little bit lower. And now the Sodomites, the homosexual crowd, they come and completely surround Lot's house. They begin to pound on the door and they say, Lot, we know you've got these visitors in your house. Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And you understand the phrase know them was not the crowd saying we want to go down to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. The phrase know them is the same phrase earlier in Genesis where Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And my friend, the depths of sin are about ready to get even more disgusting. The depraved and the ungodly that long since had rejected the Bible and long since had rejected God, they are about ready to fall to a level that is beyond human comprehension. And as they are pounding on the door saying, Lot, we know those men are there. Lot, deliver those men unto us that we might abuse them. The Bible tells us in Genesis 19 and 6, that Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you brethren, isn't that an interesting word? I pray you brethren, do not so wickedly. Can you see it in your mind tonight? 
inside the house the angels have come from heaven to announce the judgment of God upon the city now the Bible tells us that out in front of that house the sodomites have come pounding on the door crying for the flesh of these men Lot opens the door and he slips out with heaven behind them and hell in front of him Lot is about ready to make yet one more compromise he is about ready yet to cut one more deal and we come to Genesis 19 and verse number 8 and my friend I do believe we're reading one of the most disgusting stories and statements that history's ever known and even through the pages of the Word of God it with the exception of what Judas Iscariot did to Jesus Christ I don't believe there is a more despicable act in all the Bible and now Lot stands outside that door and hears his offer he said behold now I have two daughters which have not known man let me I pray you bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof my friend can you imagine such a thing I couldn't begin to understand tonight how a most rotten vile sinner living in Cleveland Ohio could ever stoop to such a level to commit such an act I couldn't understand tonight how a man who was a drug addict of a man whose sin has destroyed his mind and his life could even fall so low to commit this horrible crime that Lot is ready to commit and yet my friend what makes it even more startling is to understand in 2nd Peter the Bible says that Lot was a man with a righteous soul my friend, this is not the story of some unsaved heathen man who offers his own daughters to the slimy crowd. This is not the story of some man who long since has dived into the deep pool and the deep water of iniquity who now offers his daughters to the same crowd. This is the story of a man who right now is in heaven, a man with a righteous soul. And Lot stands in front of the crowd and says, if you'll leave these men alone, I will give you my daughters. And you can do to them as you please you see that's why if mrs. Lot could come here tonight with the tears running down her face she could describe what it would be like to be behind the door holding your daughters in your arms and hear your own husband the children's daddy go out to the slimiest crowd of sinners imaginable and stand there and offer the purity of the daughters upon the altar of convenience I mrs. Lot could tell you what that sounds like to hear your husband make such an offer she could tell you what that dagger felt like as it went right through her heart she could tell you what it sounded like when the daughters heard their daddy make such a statement and such an offer and they begin to sob in the arms of their mother and if mrs. luck could stand here tonight she would beg you and me to understand there still is a price to pay for immorality if mrs. Lott could stand here tonight she would beg us to understand that when somebody fills their mind with dirty literature when somebody reads dirty magazines when somebody visits dirty websites when somebody fills their mind with dirty television programs mrs. Lott would beg us to understand there always is a price to pay for sin and sin when it is finished bringing forth death and while the devil might make it attractive tonight and the old devil might know how to put a can of paint upon the fence the truth of the matter is when it's all torn back there is a price to pay and sin will carry you farther than you want to go and sin will ring up a price tag that you don't want to pay and if mrs. Lott could stand here tonight she'd begin to tell the story of how immorality destroyed their home can you go in Genesis chapter 19 to the end of the chapter in verse number 30 Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him for he feared to dwell in Zoar he dwelt in a cave he and his two daughters the firstborn said unto the younger our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in after us after the manner of all the earth and come let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father and they made their father drink wine that night the firstborn went in and lay with her father and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose now the daughters are going to act as Sodom has taught them say my friend you don't suppose the daughters learned how to do that from a family altar uh, you don't suppose the daughters would learn how to do that from a Sunday school class and yet when you live in Sodom and the Bible says in second and Peter every day they were seeing the sights of Sodom they were hearing the ways of Sodom and so the philosophies and the attitudes and the thinking of Sodom had become part of these two girls and as they're living in a cave with 
with their father. They say, here's the plan. We will get our father to drink wine. When he is drunk, we will go and lay with our father and commit immorality with him. And this sordid soap opera just seems to spiral right out of control. Now look, you may be one of these people tonight who thinks, <clears throat> well now, Lot was drunk. And we certainly can't hold a drunken man responsible for his actions. Now that may be your thinking tonight. You could do yourself and, a big fa and me a big favor tonight if you just keep it to yourself. And you may think that a drunk man is not responsible for his actions. I would say if you feel that way, you probably could get a job as a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco, maybe. And it may be that's your thinking. Unfortunately, that's not the thinking of Almighty God. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. My friend, drunkenness is not an excuse to commit immorality. Drunkenness is not a license to attack one's daughters. God have mercy upon the soul of a man that would stoop so low and commit such a base sin with his own children. My friend, it may be that the ungodly liberal in America wants to coddle and play games with child molesters. And it may be that ungodly unjust judges find a way to put them out in the streets a year or two after their heinous acts. Well, I want you to know Almighty God has got an answer for the child abuser. And after they get saved now and they're sure to heaven. The Bible says they ought to be cast in the sea with a millstone hung around their body. And God have mercy upon someone who will stoop so low to attack a young lady. And the story just gets worse and worse. And if Mrs. Lot could come back from eternity and stand here tonight with the tears streaming down her face, she'll tell you what immorality did to her marriage. She'll tell you what immorality did to her soul. She'll tell you what immorality did to her children. She'll tell you the story of immorality, how the philosophy and the fornication and the attitude of Sodom found its way into the core fiber of their family and found its thinking into their minds and the hearing found its way into their ears. And if Mrs. Lott could stand here tonight, she would beg you and beg me to understand the price tag of immorality. And the Lord Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. But if Mrs. Lott could stand before us tonight, not only would she beg us to remember the consequences of immorality, it'll destroy your family. Number two, Mrs. Lott, I do believe, would tell us this, to remember the consequences of a ruined testimony. Remember the consequences of a ruined testimony. Can you see her stand here tonight and tell us what immorality did to her home? And then she's going to tell you what a ruined testimony will produce. The Bible tells us that as the Sodomites were ready to attack Lot, in verse 10, the men, the angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so they wearied them themselves to find the door and it's tragic that the wicked sins of Sodom found their way down to the young to the small and the great now in verse 12 the men said unto Lot hast thou here any besides son-in-law thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in this city bring them out of this place for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it my friend do you understand the sober warning now the angel says to Lot and here's why we have come God has sent us with a message of judgment and if you have any family in this city you better go right now and you better better plead with them to flee this city because the judgment of God is going to fall upon this place. And so in verse number 14, Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, notice plural, which married his daughters, and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. And you see him run down the street and he begins to pound on the door of son-in-law number one. And an out of breath, Lot says, get your wife, maybe there's grandkids, get the kids and get out of here. You got to get out of town because God is going to send fire and God is going to destroy this place. you got to go. you got to go right now. There is no warning. You have got to evacuate and run for your life. And as he begins to plead with his son-in-law, take his daughter and take perhaps some grandchildren and run from that city, here's the response he gets. He seemed as one that mocked his son-in-law. His son-in-law looks in the face and says, Old man, 
what in the world has gotten into you? You know, Lot, I never heard you talk about God before. And his own son-in-law slams the door in the face of Lot. Can you see him run down the street and he tries it again, pounding on the door, saying, get the wife and get the kids and get out of town because God's going to destroy this place. The angels have come to tell us it is so. And who knows how many sons-in-law he had. Who knows how many of his daughters had married the men of Sodom. Who knows how many grandchildren were left behind. But the Bible tells us those sons-in-law mocked and laughed in the face of that old man. And if Mrs. Lot could stand here tonight, she would beg us to understand the consequences of a ruined testimony. Because tonight, the sad truth is this. When a child of God loses their testimony, somebody they love ends up in hell. Is there somebody like that at Cleveland Baptist Church tonight? Is there somebody tonight right here sitting in this place, if you were to go to your own son or your own daughter, if you were to go to your own in-laws, your own dad, your own mom, and if tonight you were to sit in the living room and with tears running down your face, you were to beg your own family members to come to Christ and be saved, and you were to warn them, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I wonder if there is somebody here tonight, if you were to go to your own family and beg them to be saved from hell. Your own family member would look and start to laugh and say, you're a Christian? The language that you use, what's the difference? The places you go, what's the difference? The things you say, the stuff you watch on TV, the music coming out of your system, what's the difference between you and from me? By the things you say, the jokes you tell, the places you go, what's the difference? And I wonder how many people tonight, perhaps that come week after week after week to Cleveland Baptist Church in their neighborhoods, on the job where they go to school, in front of their own family, have so lost their testimony from their temper, from their anger, from the jealousy, from the lust, from the sins, from you name the sin tonight. But I wonder how many have so lost their testimony that when it all washes out, there's a father or a mother, a son or a daughter, maybe even a grandchild, who one day is going to be in hell because somebody lost their testimony. You see, now it's serious business. And back when Lot was compromising his testimony so he could be elected as a judge and sit in the gate, and back when they would see and hear the things taking place in Sodom and, and they would laugh about it or they would excuse it or they would say, well, you know, we kind of mute those parts of the commercials. And he came up with all the reasons and all the excuses why he could be in Sodom, sing like Sodom, talk like Sodom, think like Sodom, hear what Sodom had to say and somehow still be different. Now when it all comes out in the wash, his sons-in-law, his daughters, and probably grandchildren, they died when the fire fell. And it won't be funny when some of our loved ones are cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and they're there because we blew our testimony. If Mrs. Lot could stand here tonight with tears streaming down her face, she'd say, remember the consequences of immorality. There may be pleasures in sin for a season, but when the knife of immorality is finished, your family life will be in shreds. If Mrs. Lot could stand here tonight, she would tell us, remember the consequences of a lost testimony. Because if you lose your testimony, Somebody that you dearly love will end up in hell. But you know, there's a third thing Mrs. Lott would give us tonight. 
For the Savior said, remember Lot's wife. We better remember the consequences of immorality. We better remember the consequences of a ruined testimony. But number three, I do believe Mrs. Lot would tell us tonight to remember the consequences of worldliness. Remember the consequences of worldliness. I find verse number 15 to be an astounding verse. For the Bible says, and when the morning arose, put it together. The angels look Lot square in the eyeballs and say, God's going to destroy this city. Lot believes them to the point of running down the street, pounding on his family's door, begging them to leave. They laugh at him and will not leave. And so now Lot returns to his own house. And do you know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us the guy goes to sleep at night. Now, I don't know how you see that. But I can promise you that if two angels were to come marching down this aisle tonight and they were to walk up this platform and say to Brother Folger, that God is so sick and tired of the sins of Ohio that God is going to send fire and brimstone upon this state. Now, I don't know how you see this, but I got to tell you something, folks. If the angels came and told that to your preacher tonight, I'm getting out of town. And I can't think of too many good reasons to go to Michigan. <laughs> but that probably would pass as a reason. But I can promise you for sure that if the angels came in this building and told your preacher God was going to deal with Ohio, that I'm not going to go and get a good night's sleep and figure it out in the morning. I'm out of Dodge tonight. But you know what Lot does? Lot goes home and he goes to bed. And evidently, he must have slept pretty well that night, for the Bible tells us in the next morning, in verse number 15, when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. I mean, the sun rises and Lot's sleeping in. And finally, the angels come to his bedroom and say, Get out of bed, man. Don't you understand the judgment's coming? Hey, you got to wake him up. You know, there's old Lot saying, Come on, I haven't had my cup of coffee yet. Hey, old Lot trying to hit the snooze button for 10 more minutes. And the angel's saying, what are you doing, man? The fire of God is going to fall. And now finally Lot gets out of bed. You know, his hair's a mess. He got his bathrobe on. And the girls are fighting and they don't want to get up yet. And Lot's trying to wake him up. And mama's yelling at the girls. And the Bible tells us in verse number 16, and while he lingered. You know why he lingered? Because spiritually his feet were sinking in the quicksand of the world. Can you see these angels saying, Lot, it's time to go. Lot, your time is up. Lot, Sodom is history. And old Lot is saying, just a minute here, just, I'm just getting on a computer. You know, I, I, come on, come on, I'm getting Scott trade here. I got one more trade to go. Man, I'm going to make a big investment in fire insurance. Come on, man, just calm down here a little bit. And old Lot says, Yo, where's my checkbook? Oh, come on, man, where did I put all those porting papers? Uh, where did I hide that cash? And you know, his wife is over here, and she's trying to figure out what jewels to put in the box. And he can't fit all her pearls and all her diamonds in. And back in the bedroom, the girls are fighting with each other. And uh, she wants to wear that and mama she won't give me my this and that and they're all fighting and they're all griping with each other and the little girls can't figure out what to wear and mama can't get her jewelry together and Lot's still looking for his bank book and finally the angel come and the Bible tells us that while he lingered one angel grabs a hold of Lot's hand he grabs the hand of his wife and the other angel grabs the hand of a daughter and the hand of another daughter and folks I don't know if it is possible for there to be an understatement in the Bible. I don't know if that's possible. But if there is an understatement in the Bible, it is in verse 16. And while he lingered, the men lay hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, and this would be it. The Lord being merciful unto him. And it says, they brought him forth and set him without the city. Oh, can you see how embarrassing it must have been? The angels grab the hands of these four people like their little children and lead them away. And if Mrs. Lot could stand here tonight and she could give something to you and something to me, she would say, remember the consequences of worldliness. We live for what Sodom had to offer. But when the fire of God came, it's like you've heard the story many times. Two people were watching the millionaire as his body was being lowered in the grave. You've heard it. I one whispered to the other, I wonder how much he left. And there came that great reply. He left it all. 
You know how much Lot left in Sodom? He left it all. When a Christian sinks into the depths of worldliness and that old quicksand is so slow, isn't it? And it's not overnight, it's not in a hurry because there could well be somebody tonight just like Lot and his wife and somebody tonight who once was faithful and loved the Lord and I you serve God at Cleveland Baptist Church and now it's Sunday night, you're still sitting in church. And why you mere most Wednesday nights, he's still serving God and the offering plate comes by, you know, it's good business to tithe and it's good business to give the missions. God blesses whoever who does that. And so you do those things and, and you convince yourself everything's all right. But the truth is tonight, you and the Lord know everything's not all right. Because while you may be in the right place and you may be sitting in church on Sunday night, your body is here tonight, but your heart is long since gone. How subtle and how crafty is it? As in Hebrews, the Bible said, harden not your hearts, harden not your hearts. How easy it is for us to sit in our churches, sing the songs, say the prayers, give our tithes and offerings. We can work on a bus route. We could teach a Sunday school class. And yet, whereas a year ago or two years ago, we did it with a heart of love and a heart of gratitude to the Savior. But now our heart is kind of grown cold. And the things of the world have become so important that the things of God have become less important. And we can all become very mechanical on the outside. But the world has robbed our hearts from God. No wonder the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You see why the Savior said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No wonder he said, Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. He understood stand tonight where our treasure is and where our hearts are tonight those are the things that are going to be closest and dearest to every single one of us and when we begin to allow the world and its attraction to suck us into their mire and we come to the place in our lives where maybe the outside is still right but the inside is in love with the things of the world we are walking down the path of destruction and if Mrs. Lott could stand here tonight, she'd beg us to re-understand -re and remember the price you pay for immorality. It'll destroy your family. Tonight, she would beg us to understand the price you play, pay when you ruin your testimony because if you lose your testimony, somebody you love will go to hell. Tonight, she would beg us to understand the price that you pay for worldliness because the deeper we sink into the world, the more our eyes are blinded to the preaching of the Bible and the warnings of Almighty God. And Jesus said it like this, Remember Lot's wife. Number one, remember the consequences of immorality. Number two, remember the consequences of a lost testimony. Number three, remember the consequences of worldliness. But there's one more thing I think Mrs. Lott would have for us tonight. And I do believe with the tears streaming down her face, she would beg us to remember the consequences of looking back. Remember the consequences of looking back. The Essene in verse number 17, And it came to pass when he had brought them forth abroad, that he, the angel again, that he said, Now, I got to tell you, folks, when I read the rest of verse 17, now I don't see anything in this verse that's hard to understand. You don't have to be a rogue scholar to figure it out. The angel said it like this, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither see thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. My friend, you don't have to be a Hebrew linguistic expert now. You don't have to have some great understanding of nuances of words. I mean, in other words, what part of run for your life do you you have trouble with and the angel looked them square in the eyes and said you run and escape and you don't look back you run for your life and you don't look back there is nothing here that even a child could not comprehend and yet when you get to verse number 25 as it says in 24, the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire. Notice it came from the Lord out of heaven. It was not a volcano that burst from a mountain near Sodom. It was not some other kind of natural disaster. No, the Bible is very specific that this was the fire of God and it came from the Lord from heaven. 
And the Bible says in 25, he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. And you see Lot and his two daughters and his wife and they are running for their life and now the fire of God falls. Can you just imagine what that must have sounded like as a burning fireball comes all the way from heaven upon that city? And no question that even as they run through the plains, they can hear the screams of horror of men and women and boys and girls as they look up to the sky and there's no place to run and there's no place to go. There is no place to turn. You cannot escape the wrath of God. And as they are running for their lives, they can hear the sound of the fire fall. Probably even hear the screams of their loved ones in Sodom. And the Bible says in verse 26, but his wife looked back. By the way, that phrase, look back, is interesting. It does not mean that she was running along, she stumbled, and when she stumbled, she accidentally took a quick look back and turned away. No, the phrase is very specific. When it says his wife looked back, it means that she stopped and she took an intentional long look back. There was no accident. She stopped and she gazed back at the city that she loved. And when she gazed back at that city, God kept his word as he always does. And God took her life. And if Mrs. Lott could stand here tonight, she would beg us to remember the consequences of looking back. I wonder if there might be somebody at Cleveland Baptist Church tonight who's tempted to look back just like Mrs. Lott did. Oh, you first got saved and you're so thankful for what the Lord had done. And, and when you used to live for Saturday nights, now you started to live for Sunday mornings. And you know, the old world thinks they've got it over us and they laugh at Christians that have no pleasure and no joy in their life. But you know, at least when Sunday morning comes, we can remember where we were on Saturday night. And you remember the day for once you live for liquor and once you live for immorality and once you live for what sin could produce. I'm preaching, I'm certain in a crowd like this tonight of men and women that could stand up and say, preacher, our marriage was on the rocks and if it wasn't for the grace of God we long time ago would have found ourselves divorced how many men could stand up here tonight and say if it wasn't for the grace of God I, or I would be in jail tonight or I would be dead that was the path that I was taking how many could stand up and say preacher in my teenage years I was heading full course towards a brick wall my life was about ready to be destroyed but Jesus saved me and now did he save my soul he saved my life he saved my marriage he saved my family he saved us from destruction and all around this building tonight there are people stand up and testify when the Lord saved me he changed everything and I in honesty I owe everything to him tonight and yet as time goes by we humans find a way to forget don't we and all of a sudden the old devil creeps up and says you know Remember way back yonder with that old crowd, there was a lot of good times, weren't there? Really? It was good times not even knowing where you were the night before? It was really a good time to wake up the next morning and wonder, did I do something foolish last night? Really, those are good times. But you know, as time goes by, all of a sudden the ugliness of sin and slowly but surely all the heartache and the tragedy and destruction that sin brings, it's all replaced by that good old nostalgic feeling. And I wonder if there's somebody tonight, there's starting to be a pull in your heart to start taking a look back. Back to the old friends. Back to the old parties. Back to the old good times back to the old pleasures of sin. And if Mrs. Lott could have something to say to you tonight, she'd tell you what happens when you look back. She'd describe the judgment of God and the wrath of God upon people who want to gaze back upon what the devil and what the world is God. And if Mrs. Lott could stand here tonight, she would tears stream down her face. She'd tell you if you look back, you do it to your own destruction. Oh, that's why the Bible says we're supposed to be looking forward. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
No wonder the Bible tells us that when we come to the place where we're double-minded and we got one foot on the world's side and one foot on God's side, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. No wonder the Savior said, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I wish thou were hot nor cold, but because thou art lukewarm, he said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There's somebody tonight you got saved. You identified with the Savior. You followed the command of Moses who said, who's on the Lord's side? And you took that invitation. You stood up for Jesus and you started to stand for him and live for him. And yet now you feel yourself starting to slide back and the temptation is to stop and to gaze back to the old way and to take a long look back. And if you take a long look back, you do it at the risk of the judgment of God. As the ages have gone by, this woman who was turned into a pillar of salt, now the sands and salts of time have overwhelmed her in the place where she stood. All the weather have obliterated that mournful stature, of yet the Lord Jesus Christ has embalmed this woman in the Bible as a warning for all time. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Remember Lot's wife. Remember the price you pay for immorality. Remember the price you pay when you lose your testimony. Remember the price you pay when you sink into the world. And remember the cost of looking back. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together, please, tonight so we can pray.